And so it started way, way back 200 years ago. And of course, South African history is, is filled with clashes. Firstly, between the white people and the black people who met and clashed. And then between different groups of white people, because the, the initial settlers were Dutch, and basically the British came in. During the Napoleonic Wars, the British came into South Africa, and then the British did something that the Dutch found particularly odious. They abolished slavery. You may remember the name William Wilberforce, who was very much in the forefront of the abolition of slavery, approximately 1830. And when they did that, the Dutch farmers lost their supply of labor, free labor. And so they moved. And so there were then clashes throughout the 19th century between the Afrikaner farmers, the Dutch farmers, and the British, culminating in the Anglo-Boer War, which lasted for three years, and the British had to put over half a million troops into South Africa to subdue 30,000 Afrikaner commando fighters. <coughs> As a result of that, interestingly, the Union of South Africa was formed, because before that, it was a sort of conglomerate of a number of different states, a little bit like the United States, but fewer. And the Union of South Africa was formed. But at that time, the apartheid system began to be put into the form of legislation. Black people began to be excluded by law. And from 1948 onwards, this became a real movement. The white people at that time voted in a government of predominantly Afrikaners who were paranoid about the fact that if they gave the black people any rights at all, they would take over the country. Why? Because there were approximately 4 million whites and approximately 35 million blacks. Fairly obviously, if you give the 35 million the vote, they're going to vote and vote their own people into power. And so between 1948 and 1994, when Nelson Mandela became president, there was this system of apartheid. Now you might say, what were right-thinking white people doing about this? Tony and I were both there. In many respects, I put my hand up and I say, for quite a long time, I had my head in the sand. It was beautifully brainwashed because the press there didn't really emphasize what was going on. Perfectly obviously they didn't. But the situation was that I was able to exist very comfortably in my little white enclave, and I was able to work in an all-white school. That's something else, by the way. Education was segregated. Until about the middle 1980s, when, for one reason or another, no, in fact, before that, I suppose the year was 1980. I actually became a head of a small boys, all-white private school, but the board of that school had taken a decision at that stage to bring in non-white, Indian, Asian, black people. And so I was very fortunate to be exposed to people of other races. Tony and I met during that time, I won't go into the details of that at the moment, but actually she came into the school as um, a fundraiser, <clears throat> because what we were doing is we were trying to outreach into uh, the other races. And as a result of that, Tony and I both left the school, by then we were an item, as it were, and we started an organization which was to set up quality schools in black areas. And during the period 1989 to about 96 or 97, Tony raised something like 17 million rands. So she is a fundraiser of some note. And we actually managed to start 13 schools altogether. Um, these schools have condensed into five schools, which still exist, I'm delighted to say. And we're still involved with them peripherally in that we're trying to raise money in this country to uh, create bursaries. But we were fortunate to become involved with black communities, and it was a very uplifting experience. Because during that time, from about 1986, when Tony and I met, to 1994, South Africa went through this miracle. It went through the miracle of transformation from a dictatorship of those white people to a democracy. Because in 1990, Nelson Mandela was released from prison, 
And some of you may even remember the iconic pictures of Nelson Mandela coming out of prison, uh, standing next to his then wife, Winnie, and it, it gives me a lump in my throat even just to think about that right now. Because it was extraordinary. It was extraordinary that those tight Afrikaners allowed this to happen without a bloody revolution. There was nearly a bloody revolution on a number of occasions. During the constitutional talks, a group called the Osobar Brandwacht drove a tank through the door of the conference center that the talks were being held in. Some of you may even remember those images too. Um, but it was close. But due to, on one hand, the forbearance of the black people and the patience and the tolerance, and secondly, to the amazing ability of the Afrikaner to change the moderate Afrikaners. There are still people out there who think that uh, apartheid was a good thing. But the average Afrikaner changed and accepted. One of the reasons for this, I have to tell you, was that the world had turned against South Africa. We had been excluded from the Olympic Games, from playing rugby against New Zealand, from playing cricket against all the countries that play cricket. We were excluded. We couldn't buy oil. We couldn't buy arms, which was pretty logical, I would have said at that time, because they would have been used against the black people. But the fact is that the world brought pressure to bear. I always think that one of the most important things for South African whites was the fact that we couldn't play sport against anybody else, because we tend to win quite a lot. And it was quite difficult not having that opportunity to win. But things changed. 1994, I can remember, this is where I finish. 1994, I can remember with Tony standing in a queue for an election for the very first time. And this was an election where everybody in the country was eligible to vote. And it was quite extraordinary because we were standing next to our domestic worker. And we knew damn well that our domestic worker was going to vote for Nelson Mandela. And we knew damn well that we hadn't quite got to the stage where we trusted him yet, although I think we would now. You didn't vote for him. Um, and we were going to vote for an opposition, a liberal, white, op white-led opposition party. And of course Mandela got in, and the African National Congress has been in power ever since then. South Africa is not perfect by any means. But some of you will have seen the pictures of the World Cup just a few months ago. And you will have seen a country that is united, that does have a unified government, that is a democracy, 